uh, a reminder that things that we talked about as far as um, the uh, announcements, notices, they are up on the uh, bulletin board. If you want to find out times or locations, please be aware of that. <clears throat> so here we go. And um, our message title this morning is The Kingdom of God, semicolon, a series. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the kingdom of God. Not sure that I've ever actually, well, it doesn't make any difference whether I've done this before or not, but this is what the Lord wants me to talk about. And more or less, you don't have to make a big distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Uh, God is in heaven, and the Bible says, so he rules there, kingdom of heaven. But there's nowhere that he doesn't rule. So he is, it is the kingdom of God. So he rules everywhere. So whichever way you'd like to say it, so we're going to say the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, uh, the scripture's from Ezekiel, and so Old Testament. And really, we don't think too much about the whole concept of the kingdom of God from the Old Testament. But this is as the Lord has guided and directed me. So I think in time, you'll see how this fits. It's Ezekiel 37, very well-known passage, 1 through 14. And it is as follows. Um, I'm, it may not be exactly word for word. What's a, oh, it, it might be NASB. Well, look at that. Very nice. So, uh, <clears throat> the, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them, around them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Um, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God. Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of the graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The word of God for the people of God. Um, now, <clears throat> um, you know about the kingdom of God. So, I really uh, think I'll just sort of preach it down line from line from line, kind of like that maybe, but a little bit of background for it beforehand. Ezekiel the prophet has begun a ministry in Babylon. The people are already uh, taken captive. Many things that Jeremiah and others have prophesied over them, all of the calamity and so forth and so on, has already taken place in many by the time we get here. Many things have gone very wrong, and the people are now in a foreign land, all of the sort of eminent people, the, the uh, uh, 
princes, the, the Old Testament might speak of them, the rulers and the people of influence and the people who get things done, they've all been taken away. And so um, here he is, and he's in this place to whereby uh, things seem to be essentially desperate. People are very um, disheartened and really uh, feeling that it's hopeless. And so, <laughs> how is this to do with the kingdom of God? Well, I think this is kind of what God would say this morning. And I say those words very, very deliberately to us. God had chosen Israel for several reasons. It tells you very straight out, not because they were great, but because they were little. So they couldn't brag or say, you know, we're in these, and he raised them up. And he covenanted with these people, he called them apart, and he chose them and covenanted with them that he would be their God and they would be their people. And he gave them all manner of um, promises, and he gave them the law. And his covenant with them is that he would bless them, and he would bless them in every realm of life. I want you to really hear this. He would bless them in their crops. You know, you know, he would bless them in their government. He would bless them in war of war came. He would bless them in economics. He would bless them in fertility and multiplication. Things would grow. He would bless them in every way that you can define life. He would bless them in arts. He would bless them in uh, learning. He would bless them in every last way there is to be a blessing. God would bless them. And he had chosen them so that he could demonstrate what happens when the, um, the people who are called to him function in the way he is prescribed. Then the kingdom of God begins to manifest in blessings, in order, in justice, in strength, and in goodness. And it begins to manifest and be able to demonstrate to all the other nations around them that uh, God is a good God and we need to check this God out. And so that was the plan initially. Now, was God taken unawares by what took place? No. Many prophets had come. Many, many prophets had come. The, uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, really is already gone. 100 plus years. It's no longer there, scattered. And so now we have Judah. And so now Judah has been overtaken. And so now the people are in great despair, in great, great despair. And they don't really know what to do. And see, so God, as it were, if you think about God's plan, God's plan seems like it's stymied. Seems like it is uh, no longer possible for God to have it his way. Now, you have to ask yourself, well, what went wrong? What went wrong? And this is where we have to begin to sort of get into the scripture and see the dynamics of what went wrong. Clearly, the people had not followed what God had provided and prescribed and offered and covenanted with them to do. They were so affected by all the other nations around them and the other values of the other nations and the deities of the other nations and there was jealousy and all manner of things going on where Israel just copied. All the other nations had fertility gods sensual and sexual entities where they believed if they would do all these things they would have more crops and all kinds of things like that. And this was all happening in Israel, Baal and so forth. So after a while it seemed like, you know, there's no way God's plan is going to work out. But God, <laughs> but God is God and God's plan will work out is, is how this all works. You just have to sort of see how it flows though. Because we have gotten, the people of Israel had gotten in God's way. They missed what God wanted to do. And uh, they find themselves in this very hard, difficult place. Consequences to the choices and the lifestyles and the things that they had done is now manifest in such a harsh way that they themselves have no ability or power to do anything about it. So now you begin to see the whole notion of dead bones, I mean dry bones. There are a few things that we see in the, in the scripture starting off. And it starts off by um, the prophet uh, speaking and saying that the hand of the Lord was upon me. And I think that's a beautiful, 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 beautiful. <laughs> How many beautiful? Beautiful metaphor. <laughs> because what does that signify to you? 
the hand of the Lord was upon me, meaning you are a guidable uh, servant of the Lord. You're pliable. You listen to God. You're a servant of God. You're anxious in a good way to do what God has asked you to do. You're obedient. There's no equivocation. You're going to do it God's way. And so God can put his hand on you and say, I need you to move over here. I need you to go over there. I need you to go somewhere else. Now, I just want to say to you and to me, a little question, first of all, to your own hearts as we get along, and you know very well there's no judgment, condemnation, anything like that. Do you experience the hand of the Lord upon your life? That's a very wonderful thing to go and ask God about. That I, Lord, I want to experience your hand on my life. I realize there's something about giving my whole life to you. There's something about that to whereby I, that you're able to put your hand on my life. Now, he can do it, you know, he can prod you and push you. He's done that too. The Holy Spirit forced Jesus into the wilderness. That's what the Bible says. But that's not the way we mean it here. He means this was a vessel who would hear from God. Okay, we good with that? Then it says that, so here is in the middle of their predicament where it seemed like the kingdom of God was not only not going forward, it was fizzled out, it was completely uh, taken captive and was not functioning at all and seemed like it was dead. We okay with the metaphor here? The reason we have to see it this way is this. It says that he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord. He brought him out. So that means to say that wherever he was physically, God moved, he's remained there physically, but he moved him spiritually. You follow me? He was in the same place physically, but he moved spiritually. I've told you this story in my life a few times maybe, but some of you may not have heard this before, but I'll, I'll just go through it briefly. So <clears throat> starting off our ministry in the Methodist church, uh, the DS had told us it was going to be a church. We were all geared up. And so we'd gone through um, uh, candidacy and all of that kind of stuff as a local pastor. And I was, um, uh, I was serving as a lay minister at Lowe's and Fishes in Pensacola. Rick Humphreys is the director there, a wonderful man of God. And so around May, um, now about April maybe, I went to Rick and said, I, uh, I need to tell you I'm impressed by the Lord that I'll be leaving in June. And I really felt the Lord tell me to go tell him that so that he would have a chance to know what he was going to do to the job that I was doing. And so I went and told him that. And then we were expecting the DS to call us and say, okay, you've been appointed here and there. And the DS, I called up the DS because I knew it was time that I should have heard. He said, well, Alan, I'm really sorry. I told you that was going to happen. But it turns out it can't happen. But you're number one for next year. And I was really kind of really disappointed because he clicked off a year of my life, you know. And it happens, you know. You get... So, <clears throat> so anyway, Gary and I said, well, how do we understand this? I've, I'm pretty, I mean, I, I'm confident I heard from God. I, I went in and told the people that I'm not going to be there any longer now. And, you know, so was I counting my chickens? No, I just, that's, so, so we purposed that we were going to go to uh, Alabama. We lived in Pensacola at the time. And uh, we had a little green um, Subaru. And uh, that's not relevant, but just, uh, anyway. <laughs> I just like that little car. So, we, so uh, we're going to go to Foley, Alabama, and so we're, we're driving along, and uh, so we're saying we're going to go to a bed and breakfast away from what we already know, away from everything else, and we're going to go and seek the Lord and make blot everything else out and figure this out. What? How did we miss? What happened? Right. So we're driving along, and this is what happened. We're driving along, and the next thing I know, I'm going through the doorway of number eight Talbot Street in Utenards County down Northern Ireland. And as I go up the, um, as I go up the hallway, there's a gramophone player, and for you younger people, believe it or believe it not, is there any younger people here? Way back yonder, you had to wind those things up. Unbelievable. So anyway, <laughs> you wound up the gramophone. You put the needle on it, you know, like you see in the movies with the thing. And it was, playing the, uh, it was playing the old rugged cross. And it had an a, a old-fashioned, sweet kind of a spirit in that house. 
And so uh, that's where I was. And uh, to understand that is that when I came back to my present location, which was driving the car, Garland was pressed over on the other side against the door because she heard me talking with a thick Irish accent, which I can't do any longer. But in the spirit, I was carried back in the reality of being in my friend's house that I grew up with, and all of that was vivid and was coming out of my mouth. I was in one place spiritually. Now, it's important to realize this is not a vision in the normal sense where the prophet is up somewhere and he sees something. It's not that. He's carried away in the spirit. He's in it. See the difference here. He's in this. He's not seeing it. He's in it. He's carried away in the spirit. We okay? That's important because that means that God very, very, very definitely wants to get the point across in an experiential way. In a vivid experiential way where you feel it. Now, having to do with our little story, all that was going on there is the following Sunday. We get a call from the DS, and the DS says, he was up at, uh, I was in Sunday school, and he was up at conference, and he says, Alan, he says, look, it hasn't worked out the way we thought, and so-and-so won't be able to do it. Are you able to go, uh, <laughs> are you able to go and start preaching next Sunday? I got like six days notice. And so um, I said, well, sure. And we went to a little country church where all they knew was old-fashioned gospel music. Now, we were, you know, contemporary music folks, and that's what we really liked, and we were into it. And what God was doing was preparing my heart that I also was from a time, and my parents were from a time, and I had known, and old-fashioned gospel music was fine, and I was connected to that too. He was conditioning me to be ready for when I was going to that church that I wouldn't be upset and wouldn't know what to do. The goodness of God. He carried me away in the spirit. That was the only way he could make that happen. We okay? So, so here he is. He's, he's, and then it says a few things. How you know that, that God's really working. He says this. And it was full of bones. The middle of the valley. He set, he set me down. So he brought me down. So it wasn't a long vision. He brought me right into it. It's like me going up the hallway. He brought me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about. He made me walk around them. He made me see them all. I was right in the middle of them. I was avoiding them. I was going over them. Put yourself maybe in a graveyard where you do that. Right? Now what you do? They were all over the place. And so he, God positions him where he has to go through and see them all. They have to deeply get into his heart, into his mind, into his psyche, into his experience. He has to really feel it all. And so God makes that all happen for him. And he sees, the, he sees them much more clearly, much more vividly. And um, he sees them as they really are. And so um, he says, uh, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. They had been there for a long time. There wasn't anything going on. There was no sign of life whatsoever. They were bleached probably. They were there a long, long time. See, if you have a long vision, you, you don't get that. But if you're walking right in the middle of it, you see every last little aspect of what God wants you to see. If he's got his hand on you. Uh, there was no possibility of any life. They maybe seem fragile and, and maybe brittle to him. So God asked them, can, can they live? <laughs> so what would your answer have been there? <laughs> like his probably. Well, <laughs> you know God. <laughs> you know the answer to that. That's a pretty good answer, I think. So <laughs> it's a smart answer. Well, you know how that would turn out, God. You know the answer. Um, why did he ask him that? Why do you ask him that? Why put him through that? Why would he ask him that? How big is your God? How big is any of our God? My heart is that this will tie together after a little while. How big is for any of our God? See, because in the natural sense... No, the answer is no, is it not? 
In the natural sense, when you're dead, you're dead. In the natural sense, when you're dead and have been dead 20 or 30 years, that's what you look like. So in the natural sense, there is no, there's no magic bullet for that. That's the wrong metaphor anyway. No magic, no, uh, no pill for that. No, no inoculate, no, no medication for that. <laughs> no science for that. Get my mixed metaphors here. So, um, so there's no way. And you see here that there is something that God has to demonstrate to the prophet. That God is bigger than any circumstance. So now, the kingdom of God was not flourishing, not functioning, not barely existing as you see, as you see Israel representing the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Do you follow the way I mean that? On the earth, while in the Old Testament, you know, 600 years before, 660 years before Christ, they would have represented the kingdom of God on the earth. God's rule and reign would have been manifest through them to display who he was. And there was no display at all. There was dry bones, wounded hearts, captured people. And so he says, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy with these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So here we go again. Hear the word of the Lord. So whatever God says... The word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. I will cause breath to enter you. The things that have been, that can be seen, have been made by that which cannot be seen. Is that not what the Bible says? Can you see breath? Can anybody here see breath? The reason I say that is this. Even in your heart, there are struggles against what science says about creation. There are struggles in your heart about what um, this whole thing of evolution and all these other aspects of life. There's struggles and you don't have necessarily a good answer for these things, although there are good answers. We just don't have them presented to us in a way, and I could maybe help with that if anyone's interested. In fact, apologists would, would be able to say it's folly to believe, absolutely folly to believe in evolution. And I believe that with all my heart. And I don't want, that's not where this is going, so I don't want to take that rabbit trail. Cause breath, and now come to life. And I will put sinew on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am God. Something is uh, being said here and it's somewhere along the way they forgot that he was God. Somewhere along the way they forgot that he was a holy God, a loving God, and a powerful God. Somewhere along the way they got distracted. Somewhere along the way they lost focus on what their mission was. They lost focus on what their mission was. I'm going to say this again. They lost focus on what God had called them to do. They lost focus on the covenant they had with God to display the glory, the goodness, the power, the love, the provision, the safety, the well-being, the fruitfulness, the goodness, and every other word that you can think to display that on the earth. They lost track of that. And now we find that they have been taken captive they have been sidelined. They've been told to shut up. Just mind your business. Eat your little food. And that's the end of you. That's all we want from you. As far as the children of Israel. They felt, I'll read that a little later on. They just felt like they might as well be in the grave. And they get this vision from the Lord that says, that is not the end. That is not how this is going to end up. What you see, you have to see. You have to see your powerlessness first. You have to see your powerlessness first. Because you've acted and you have lived in such a way to suit yourself, do whatever you see fit. You thought it was all in the bag. You thought you were rich, like it says in Revelation. Right? Not rich at all. And all these things have to happen like this before I can move to show you something. So let's move on a little bit. So I prophesied, and I was, as I was commanded, and, I, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. What does that mean, bone to its bone? 
Now, I do not mean to get on anybody's case or be hard or in any way get on some kind of soapbox and, and rant and rave or anything else, but that means that these bones were scattered all over the place, and if you're a body and scattered all over the place, and you're just your own bone, and he's just his own bone, and everybody's just their own bone, nothing good's going to happen. Nothing good is going to happen, and the body is not going to function. Nothing good is going to happen if it's just about you, your ministry, and your relationship with God. Nothing is going to happen. Nothing. Nothing except decline, decrease, and then finally, finally death. And why is it death? Because that which you're called to do is not occurring. That's what he says about the fig tree. Why should it still remain? It's not doing what it was supposed to do. What a, what a bone to its bone. So what was the click? The click was the, this thing was clicking into this thing at the knee. Arms were clicking into the shoulders. All the finger joints were clicking together. Everything where it was supposed to be. Clicking together. Rattling until it fit. No? So what he did is what we see he doing is he brought the body back into right order. Could we say amen? amen? Right functioning, right capacity, right capability, right strength. As that body was designed, no longer scattered. Remember, he had them walk in over here. There's an elbow here. Oh my goodness, there's some toes here. There. That's what it says. Now, you can admit it to yourself, admit it to me, and I don't like it either. We do not like to be called out on this stuff. In our human way, because we think we're all there. In our spiritual way, we know desperately that we need to hear this. We, need to, we really need to hear what God is saying to the church. We really need to hear what God is saying in this hour. We really need to hear his heart. So we're kind of, you know, in tension between the two. So then it goes on. <clears throat> they came together and I looked and behold, sinew was growing. So all the ligaments and joints were there. Then, then the meat came and then the skin, all the organs in there. Then he said, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, uh, O breath, and breathe on those slain. Now isn't it interesting they say slain? Here's how, what I'm going to take from that slain. Um... You're teaching and John's teaching and a part of that teaching there's an enemy, is there not? There's one little word telling you there's an enemy. And that enemy comes in so many words to slay you, steal, kill, and destroy. He comes, and it can be done subtly and be done many, 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 many ways. One of the ways, one of the ways the most vile and subtle lie that Satan tells us is like this. That Jesus died so I could go to heaven. That's not the truth. Part of why Jesus died, part of it is that you get to go to heaven. But that's not why he died. Here's why he died. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. And he says, it's right here in your very midst. He walked around. He was the, he was the manifest power, life, dimension, fullness of the kingdom in one person. Everywhere he went. Kingdom order was taking place everywhere he went. They knew he was a king. And let me tell you, the kingdom of God is supposed to rule the earth. I'll just start, start there. The kingdom of God in every realm, in government, in art, in science, in education, in every realm you can think of, just like it was with Israel. The kingdom of God, we have been commissioned to preach the kingdom and to bring the kingdom and to live the kingdom. So Jesus got in trouble because they realized this man is a rival to the kingdom of this earth. He is a rival to Caesar and a rival to power. He's a rival to all these things. And he cannot exist. So he was killed because he was a king bringing a kingdom. 
He told us to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, all right, this might hurt your toes a little bit. That enemy who slew them, think of, later on he says that, it's a little bit tricky to keep this all together, but, um, um, he said this is the whole household of Israel that he was talking about, um, and that um, they just felt lost. And he talks about opening their graves and so forth and so on. But here's what Satan has done for the church, <clears throat> to the church, against the church. I really want you to hear this. When science and education, rationalism, and all these things began to take hold, the church was so smug, so operating by itself, that it didn't have an answer for these things. Didn't have an answer for the Scopes trial. Didn't have an answer for anything else. Didn't have an answer. And where science began to get bigger and bigger, the church just retired. The church just retired into the church, no longer seeking to be salt and light, no longer really doing it. Really, the church's desire after that was just to have nice services. Just to have a nice time where people could go and worship and be nice. And the gospel became a gospel of, let's me just get blessed until I go to heaven. I told you to get on your toes a little bit. Let me tell you, if that's how you see the gospel, you might as well die now. What are you waiting for? I'm not being ugly. If all you think it is, is God blessing you until you get to heaven, die now. Get to heaven early. I am so serious. We are called to do something. We are called to be salt and light and change what we see on the earth. Not the politicians, us. We want somebody else to do this. But Jesus said he were to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we say to ourselves, you know, we lament. Oh, well, you know, we don't really see any power any longer. That power was back then when they were starting off to confirm, to confirm that Jesus is really running things, to confirm that really was of God. And we nicely package that so we don't have to have our conscience strained in any way. But let me tell you, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find that they say they've turned the world upside down. There was no such thing as having a sweet little meeting. No such thing as what's my ministry? What, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And, 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 and all about me. There's nothing about the kingdom in that. That's soulish Christianity. It's an anathema to God. Die now. Go to heaven. Hear it. Die now. Go to heaven. This is where they were. They had lost completely what God had called them to do. So now they had been taken captive. So the church retreated. We said, oh, we'll be nice people. We'll be, you know, we'll be decent, good, nice people. We'll try to get folks saved. You know, that's not the gospel. Seek first the kingdom. All the other stuff happens. It's part, it's part of belonging to God that you end up to be in heaven with him forever. But that's not what he's called you to do. Just wait for heaven. He has not called you to do that. He's called you to be salt and light and change everything around you. And to waste your life doing that. To spend your life doing that. To be that. And to train others and to get others to understand how that's done. We say it's too far gone. We say there's no way. We say secular humanism is everywhere. We say it's impossible. We say everything has been taken over. My goodness, Muslims are taken over. My goodness, they're throwing uh, Christians out of everything. My goodness. And then they say, oh, 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 worse than that, they're now telling the church what they can and cannot preach. Uh-huh. And so the church is being slain. No. The church is being slain. 
The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. I want to tell you, God is not going to let that happen. God is not going to let that happen. You either die and go to heaven or get on board. I'm serious. Die and go to heaven. It's not about you. It's not about your ministry. It's not about you being blessed. It's not about your life. It's nothing about that. You were saved so you could be connected up as a body, as working together for the kingdom's sake to see the power of God manifest on the earth. That's why you're here. Yes, you get to go to heaven, but that's not, it's not just about you. It's never been about you. It's about the kingdom of God. If you've got a solitary, insular, personal, selfish gospel, it's soulish. Go to God about that. If you're concerned about your well-being, my blessing, my stuff, my ministry, all of that, that's really at the bottom of it all. Really, 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 really your heart's desire for you to be relevant, you to be important, you to be significant. That's soulish. That is not to do with the kingdom of God. You're not given. God's hand is not on your shoulder. I praise God that there's some amens. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, this is where the church is. What does the church say? Our bones are dried up. Our hope has perished. We're completely cut off. They're trying to tell us who we're supposed to marry. They're trying to tell us we can't say this. That's hate speech. They're trying to do it. We're cut off. There's nothing we can do. How did this come about? The same way it came about, the very same way it came about for Israel. Because we did not stay loyal and faithful to what God had called us to do, what the mission of the church is, to preach the gospel of the kingdom and see it manifest on the earth. For you to think for one second that God cannot raise up people to be able to eloquently and powerfully preach the kingdom in such a way that vividly that people can get this. Politicians can get it. Doctors can get it. People in science can get it. And realize that God's hand is in everything. We have come down to this very narrow little way. Oh my goodness. Because we feel threatened in the church. And we say it's hopeless for goodness sakes. We're losing people. People are not paying attention anymore. Because why? We see no power. And why are we seeing no power? We're seeing no power because nobody is looking towards the kingdom of God. We're seeing no power because nobody's focused on the kingdom of God. We're focused on us. Heal me. Bless me. Increase me. And God is not really interested. Not in that stuff. Seek first. I've got this God saying. Seek first the kingdom. All the stuff you're interested in. He's bringing Ezekiel to the realization, I have power over everything, over life and death. We all need to see the kingdom manifest this way. We all do. So we see very rarely in the Old Testament some representation, some vivid, uh, I don't know what the word I want here, um, allusion to the fact that there is going to be a resurrection. The grave will open. 